Arthur here giving the Tezos dev update uh, for November 2nd. I'm in Paris, I've been back since Monday and a lot to uh, talk about this week. So first off, the JBuilder uh, build system that I mentioned in uh, two dev uh, updates ago, uh, that's finally complete. So if you build the nodes today, you will be building it with JBuilder and you'll notice it's much faster. It's also much faster to recompile. And like I mentioned two updates ago, this is something that's gonna let us um, take the protocol apart from the rest of the code, which is pretty cool. It means you can run it as a library uh, outside of a node. Uh, you could compile it to JavaScript. You could do a lot of things with it. It also means that we're moving our unit test uh, to directly call the protocol. Right now, we have shell scripts that run a node and interrogate the node. It's more like an integration test. So we can really directly test the protocol by extracting it. Uh, you may have a problem compiling the node. You, if you see uh, an, an error that mentioned alias underscore off, it says you need the dev version of JBuilder. And probably the easiest way to solve it is you just create a new OPAM switch, a clean one, uh, OPAM update, OPAM upgrade, and then run make build devs, and you should be good. Uh, and so you'll notice the build is a, a lot faster, which is uh, very pleasant. Uh, a lot of small uh, tweaks to uh, Mikkelsen and a refactor that uh, Benjamin has been work had been working on for a while. So this is a refactor, again, that lets you extract parts of the uh, Mikkelsen code, the interpreter, the preprinter, and extracting them means you can run them standalone. So you can run them as libraries, you can compile them to JavaScript, you can do a lot of things with them without having to query an entire node. So if some folks want to be building an IDE, for example, this is a great way to do that. Uh, in terms of the test nets, we had a few uh, glitches last week. So one was caused by a stack overflow caught by Grégoire. Uh, we use uh, LWT, which is an asynchronous monad in the code. And so if you had a long chain to validate, what it would do is try to validate the last block. But then it would say, ah, I, I need to validate the previous block. So it would create this chain, but it would create all this thread. And instead of yielding, it would just like wait on all of them. And then far down, it would find an invalid block. And the whole thing would stack overflow. So that was fixed, but there's still some stuck nodes and we're not entirely sure why. So one explanation is that the nodes are a little shy and sometimes they, they, they stop asking other nodes if there's a better head that they should be uh, aware of. Another possibility is that somehow they get into a bad state. So what we're doing about this is we're adding uh, more uh, debug information. So there's already better uh, debugging messages uh, in the node. We're also adding some RPCs so we can interrogate the node and, and, and ask it what states its validation is in. However, uh, since we're pushing a new validator, the, uh, the, the, the famed um, uh, StreetPass validator and, and, and a new scheduler for it, uh, mostly all of these bugs are probably gonna be gone and we're gonna see different bugs, the ones introduced by the new code. So, um, you know, I I think there we'll we'll have a lot of uh, we'll have a lot of work to do around uh, around that one. But in general, having better RPCs and having better error messages is something that's going to pay off with both implementation. Like I mentioned last week, there's been a lot of work on documentation. Uh, myself, I've been working on documenting primarily. Um, the proof of stake algorithm. So we had the white paper, there's a proof of stake.md file, which I don't think was widely distributed, which gives a better overview. But overall, we haven't had a very precise uh, definition of a proof of stake algorithm beyond the implementation. So I'm trying to give a, a, a reference description that we can compare our implementation to. It's not gonna be as formal as the mass paper, but it should be an in-depth description of how the algorithm works with a lot of details that uh, folks have been asking questions about. Uh, one thing that I mentioned today on Riot, which is super exciting, um, there's an idea that Grégoire had. So as you may know, in, um, in Tezos, we, we, we count tokens in roles for the purpose of delegation. That is, you have a, a bunch of tokens and that counts as one role. And when we give baking rights or endorsing rights, uh, a role is selected at random and then gets that right. So instead of having the roles aggregated at the account level, we can have the roles aggregated at the delegate level. And the security of it is exactly the same, but the difference is that if you have a bunch of small accounts and they all delegate to the same delegate, then that delegate may still get a role. So we used to have this trade-off between having a lot of roles, which would let folks with uh, just a few tokens participate in delegation and participate in voting, but which was less efficient or having something more efficient with fewer roles, but then have a higher threshold of tokens in order for your tokens to be a part of the algorithm. And so now, um, 
a lot of that is gone because it can be aggregated at the delegate level. So I'm very excited about this uh, uh, this change. Uh, so uh, yeah, one more thing. So annotation semantics for Mickelson. So currently, uh, if you use an Emacs mode for Mickelson, you're able to see the type of every uh, line of the stack at any point in the program. And that works by running a node. And so by the way, being able to compile the typer outside of the node will let you, uh, will let you do this type of thing without, you know, without having to run a node behind it. You, we might even compile uh, the protocol to ELISP and run it in Emacs. Uh, annotations go one step beyond. Instead of just telling you there's an integer, you can give it a name. So if I you do push at x3, instead of just saying you this is going to be an integer, it's going to, do, it's going to tell you, this, you know, there's x. And x is not a variable. You, you, you can't assign to it, but it tracks a value. And as long as you're just doing stack manipulation, like swaps, dip, uh, push, all of that, the program is able to track what x is. And so if you just annotate all of your data, doing stack manipulation becomes a lot easier because you, you type swap and then your you know, Emacs or your IDE is just going to tell you, okay, well, you know, you have amount in the first line and then you have transfer address in the second line and so on and so forth. So that makes it a lot easier um, to develop with Mikkelsen. So that's all for this week. So I'll be back next week with uh, more updates. Uh, in the meantime, please run a, a node on the testnet. It's been very helpful when folks tell us that they run a node and it's and it's stuck. If you do so, send us the logs. We're going to have better logs very soon. And you know that's the best thing um, beyond developing a lot of cool application. The best thing you can do for the project is run a node. We want to have many nodes on the network. Run a baker, uh, connect to the um, uh, faucet so you, you, you can actually receive some test tokens and play with them. And that is really what, hel what is helping us iron out all the kinks uh, and get ready for a launch. Thank you.